Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Rossi Mastracci. I um, work as a landscape architect and I'm also uh, teaching here at the U in the Cleveland Fellow Position. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the role of furnishings in landscape architecture, how you could think about materials and durability, um, and also how a lot of the furnishings that you design um, and paving and things that the furnishings sit on really interrelate. So I can talk to you about how, how we think of larger space making with furnishings as components and larger design ideas. Um, and I'll be talking a lot too about both what's going on above ground and underground because we think of both of them simultaneously. So um, also hopefully this will give you some more insight as to what landscape architects uh, do and consider in our work. So a little bit about me, um, I have a background in architecture and landscape architecture. Um, I'm a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture and a Master's in Landscape Architecture and I have interned and worked kind of around the world, both in the Netherlands, um, I was in the Bay Area for uh, four or five years before moving out here. Um, I'm currently the Cleveland Visiting Fellow in Landscape Architecture and I also work at a local firm um, named 10 by 10, so a really small landscape architecture firm. And I've worked on a tons, of diff tons of different projects and many phases and scales, um, kind of from a competition phase all the way through construction documentation and getting these larger landscape projects built. Uh, so a lot of things that we think about in landscape architecture is materials, what materials to use and how to choose what uh, materials we use, which I'm sure y'all are thinking about and considering on um, a daily basis. So this both goes from furnishings to paving to, you know, architects think of building materials and all that, all that is kind of under the same set of considerations. So we think about cost. How much does it cost to build? Also, how much does it cost to maintain? And how easy is it to maintain? How durable is it? How long is something going to last? Um, is it, you know, a five-year lifespan, 20-year lifespan? And what does that mean? And also in terms of maintenance to keep things um, working for that length of time. Think about materials in terms of aesthetics and experience, so warm materials, cooler materials, how you interact with things, both um, how you feel them, how you experience them, and also how that relates to how you think about design and construction techniques. Um, performance, how does something perform over time, both functionally and also performatively, so thinking of uh, water infrastructure, uh, energy generation or energy collection or power and any of those more um, infrastructural systems. We also think a lot about site constraints and conditions. So is there something about the site that is informing a larger design idea? So if, uh, you know, both from south facing, things that are facing south would get more light, might heat up, you might think about a different material in that way. If the ground is really um, impermeable, you could think about different materials and um, construction techniques in a different way. Um, and also, if something is going to be really high used and maybe have a high chance of vandalism, you might think about materials um, or even construction techniques slightly differently. Like if you know something is getting skateboarded on or tagged, or even just you know kids are going to be like playing on it really rough, it would definitely influence how you think about design of both an object. Um, and a uh, landscape space. So um, what factors start to impact durability and performance and what's the designer's role as we're thinking about these things? So like I mentioned, you know, the cost of initial construction really impacts durability and performance. If something is built cheaply and quickly, it's probably going to affect dur durability and long-term performance, right? So you um, have to weigh these cost and durability options early and really um, Think about you know longevity of a project and how that relates to how things are built, and also argue for like for those things and knowing about materials. So if you know that it needs to be um, a certain quality, and you know things need to be maintained a certain way, that and that will actually save costs long term. Being able to talk about those things up front to clients as well as other people that you're working with or other disciplines to really um, advocate for your design even if it might be a little bit more expensive going in. So as we're, as I'm working, um, a lot of, a lot of conversations around costs and material and durability and knowing just how those things relate and how you can talk about a uh, design in those terms. 
um, you know, wear and tear from intended or unintended uses. Like I talked about tagging or skateboarding um, and how that, how your design and maintenance might influence those long terms. Um, and yeah, also considering change in use or program. If you're designing something really specifically for a space that might be used in some way, but you know in 20 years it might change or has the potential to change, having the, those considerations into design. So, you know, there's a lot of discussion about integrating more tech um, and data collection in urban environments um, and how maybe a product or a, a landscape can be set up to allow for future things that we don't know are coming or going to happen um, to kind of be embedded within a design. Um, and then, you know, your other role too, I'm not going to get too much into it, you know, ensuring codes are followed, you're minimizing liability for injuries and accidents, and um, kind of understanding appropriate maintenance techniques and schedules. So not maybe as uh, relevant to you all right now, but things that you also consider while designing is definitely um, safety and making sure everything is ADA compliant or code compliant and all these other fun things. Uh, so in materials, we think about the aesthetics and ex experience of materials. So wood, um, you know, will age and weather over time and knowing, kind of knowing how, you know, a different material might gray or age is really important and could be taken into design considerations. It's also a warmer material, both visually and tactile, tactilely. So on a cold day when you're touching it, it's a little bit warmer than, say, a metal bench. I don't know if you've ever tried sitting on metal in either the dead of winter or the middle of summer. It's not terribly pleasant, so thinking of how materials and how they react to weather is really important. Um, con some of the materials, too, have a wide range of um, both formal applications and kind of texture. So concrete, you could pour something in place. It can be super complex. You can change the uh, material quality of it by you know, acid etching it or sandblasting it or even casting custom patterns into it. Um, so it's really versatile, it's you know, pretty flexible, it's one of you know, the cheaper materials. You can also do precast with concrete and make 50 of the same object pretty quickly. Um, stone you know, is also um, an interesting material choice for landscape architects. It is a little bit, you know, could be a little bit rougher. Um, it's a little higher quality, it definitely uh, conveys a different material and aesthetic choice than concrete. Um, and then there's lots of opportunities with kind of plastics and resin to do really custom, interesting things. I'm going to show a project that uses a port in place um, uh, rubber surfacing too that kind of blends the ground surface and materials in a really interesting way. So there's a lot of potentials for in, uh, different and more unique formal expressions. Um, and like I mentioned, metal. Um, you know, like with the Core 10, it could age really beautifully and have that more raw, weathered feeling. You have to be conscious of temperature and touch as well as, you know, more sharp objects. So using metal as a material for furnishings, um, there's a lot of, it's kind of unique just in that, that way that you have to be really considerate of the temperature fluctuation. Um, but it has a lot of opportunities for different finishes or colors or powder coating, um, as well as aging and weathering. So thinking of two, uh, you know, a consideration of place or where you're designing objects for. If it's in a more, you know, industrial or rough area, you might think of using more industrial or rough or beefy materials as well as a beefier design to work with the place that it's in. Or it could be super refined and clean because you're responding to adjacent conditions. So materials um, as well as form um, are, can be reflective of the place that a design is in. So a lot of things too that uh, landscape architects think about is lay, like how do you think about layout and how do you think about space programming, um, both to have uh, space perform or function in a specific way, um, to foster interactions, um, to and then both like work and function, right? Like you aren't going to put a bench in a major walkway. So thinking of two of uh, furnishings as part of the different ways of laying out a larger space. So um, often furniture can be used to define movement corridors. In this project, um, material change is also used to define where you walk um, and where you might sit. And then there's a nice you know, texture and scale change in the material that starts to inform where you might be walk slower um, and gather versus um, 
where you might start moving a little bit faster. And you can see here too, like landscape architects, we think a lot about where water is going. So thinking of how to integrate um, water collection in a way that's not totally obvious, like, you know, here's a drain, but you know, how do you might use materials and sloping and different collection points more seamlessly um, within the ground plane. So we think a lot about, you know, how the ground plane and things that are sitting on it relate to each other as well as what's underground and mainly um, water and utilities. Uh, and this project also uses furniture and kind of tree planting um, to define movement corridors. It's a little bit more looser, so you can imagine kind of wandering and meandering through that while it still has a directionality and it's still zoned in a couple of different ways, right? So this middle zone with planting uh, some trees and some furnishings, you can start to gather and sit. Um, this zone back here with more loose furnishings, um, more cafe seating, and associated with restaurants with some more looser movement corridors in the middle, um, and things that are wide enough for you to be able to move easily, um, whether it's on a this day it seems like less people are moving through or even a really crowded day. So how um, the layout of different furnishings could start to influence how you use the space. Uh, this is a diagram, it's a little washed out, um, just thinking of how those zones could be laid out. So having a really clear um, sidewalk that's free of furnishings, having another zone where the furnishings might start to um, aggregate and form smaller pockets for you to sit. Um, and then a zone of you know infrastructure, so lighting, um, lighting utilities and that kind of corridor offset from a zone of trees and planting. Um, trees don't like utilities underneath them. There's a lot of conflicts between roots, so having clear zones, um, especially in an urban environment for all these different um, water infrastructure, power infrastructure, furnishing zones and sidewalks is really important. Um, also thinking of more high contrast, this um, competition proposal was for a deaf university and um, there was also people that were hard um, visually impaired, so how we could use different materials and contrast to start to indicate um, where there's crossings or where there's moments you need to slow or pay more attention. Um, so also another way of defining different program zones, this is a very clear material change um, that uses planting and these larger plat planting pockets um, which start to suggest moments of gathering and pause, right? So how the ground plane and the design of the ground plane pushes and pulls to have these little pockets of seed, seating areas, these furnishings um, are also, you know, kind of wood. They feel like they blend into the surrounding areas a little bit more um, rather than being something that pops out and it's a little bit warmer and moments for pause even though you're against the a pretty busy street. Um, so kind of, well, I thought this diagram was a pretty clear way of just how we use materials and material change to indicate zones and also how you could think of how furnishings sit within those zones. So this is a early conceptual drawing for Nicolette Mall, which not all these things got built if you've been down there, but it still is a really clear way of how you use materials and transitions in the landscape to start to demarcate zones of pause, areas to move, um, how you think about materials, you know, having variegated colors to mask dirt, um, having high contrast edges against the street. So, you know, people that may be talking or visually impaired or even children know where the edges are. Um, and then how you could integrate more permeable paving in these tree groves um, to allow for water infiltration. So this is kind of a blow up. We're talking about water infrastructure systems that those trees are actually sitting in a larger soil cell with more soil volume to actually um, allow for these trees to look like they're popping out of paving. Um, trees need a certain amount of root and soil volume as well as water volume to actually survive. So when you see a tree in a kind of a small uh, cut out in paving and it's doing really poorly, that means you know it's probably root bound. It doesn't have enough room to grow. Um, there's different paving systems to allow for a larger root volume and still have paving on top. So I was just going to kind of talk through some of those considerations as well that while you're also looking at the relationship between furnishings, you know, 
seating elements, um, <coughs> light poles, other vertical elements that trees are super important to consider too and how they're laid out and how you might move around them. Um, so talking a little bit more of what's underground, um, I guess I'll just start over here because that's feels like where I left off, um, that what's below ground is super important. So thinking of, you know, the relationship between trees and lighting poles, um, also the relationship between all of those and underground utilities and where there could be conflicts. So it's really important while thinking about placement that you take all those things into consideration. You don't want to create conflicts with underground utilities um, and a tree or, you know, this utility corridor, which might have... Um, high speed cable and other lines and you might and you're going to put a uh, light pole in the way but it, there's actually not enough room for that other utility system to be integrated so kind of thinking of placement at a number of different levels both how you occupy space above ground and what's going on below ground um and then well I just threw this in here because I'm feeling cold, but you know, the idea that you could integrate storm melt, uh, snow melt into the paving system, um, which would be super great if it was everywhere here, but also that is another kind of infrastructure to take into consideration of how to integrate. You can integrate a snow melt system um, that reduces plowing and reduces maybe some of the wear and tear on adjacent furnishings as well as pavement systems um, or you know salt damage as a lot of the trees on Nicollet Mall apparently got oversalted and they died last year. <laughs> um, uh, another thing that we think about a lot is um, where water is going and how it can be collected. This is an uh, example of using a softer, more planted area to collect water where the pavement is sloping towards a planting area um, that reduces runoff, um, irrigates vegetation, and also allows for some groundwater infiltration um, versus all of that water going to the storm drain system and causing potential flooding concerns um, and also can water pollution and water quality concerns. Uh, so here's another series of diagrams that talk about just how those different systems could relate to each other and how you could think of, um, you know, just thinking of things below and above ground at the same time and how those different systems and plan layouts could start to um, work together and reinforce each other, and then how that could start to inform where gathering spaces are, where movement corridors are, and kind of tree planting um, groves. So, um, you know, what are some options for custom furnishings? I think when Joe was in here, he talked more about um, more standard furnishings, right? Joe um, Favor and kind of showed some. Both, uh, okay. Cool, so I'll, I'll talk through some maybe other, hopefully some other custom ones, not ones that he considered or that he talked about. Um, and just how you could think too of how furnishings and you know streetscapes or landscape architecture or other planned moves could start to relate and reinforce each other. Um, so some options, you know, this is an example for wood furnishings um, where it's a pretty simple built um, item, the materials of the bench and the materials of the adjacent paving relate to each other, right? So it's more of a seamless integration of the two systems. You can also see here that there's a pavement change, so it goes from a concrete, which might indicate faster movement, to a gravel or something crunchier and softer, which might indicate, you know, you might be a little bit slower, um, there might be a different use happening. Uh, you know, I can imagine most people crunching on that and kind of slowing down. If you're kids, you might be jumping on it, but. Um, on the High Line, they use wood a lot to relate to the kind of industrial heritage and the industrial quality of the High Line itself. So these, you know, using rather than the project before, using more planks, these are large timbers, which um, are a little bit rougher. They would age. Um, they would have more of an industrial or rougher quality to it. Um, they're also something that's a little bit more interactive. You can imagine sitting on them, you know, whether you're not talking to each other, you can sit next to each other and talk to each other. They could be play features that you can run up and down. There's a bunch of different ways that you could occupy um, this seating, you know, this kind of bench element. And I imagine you have pretty good views from one of the higher zones or one of the higher levels of it. You also see too how the linearity also relates to linearity of the high line. Right? So it kind of feels like it's another element of the larger design and not something that was just plopped in. 
Um, another example of how you could use wood for larger platforms, um, the shape and form of these relate really strongly to the plan form. So it looks like these benches are kind of emerging from a larger design. They feel like they're part of the same design language um, and they're wood, so they're a little bit warmer um, and you know more inviting for places to sit. So I thought this was just a good example of how you could use these larger platforms um, as both like a seating element, but also more of a plan feature. You can also think about um, furnishings <coughs> integrated with other systems. So these are, you know, retaining walls as part of a uh, landform. So they're both, they're kind of doing two things. They're both retaining this vegetation and also being a place to sit. Um, and it's a pretty simple move of, you know, a metal angle. Um, and you can see too, it's starting to weather and, and change in age in different ways. So knowing that they think these pieces might weather differently and being okay with that, um, you kind of have to know materials that how they age. Some things age consistently, some things could be a little bit spotty, some things could age based on um, weathering and you know like movement patterns. So being aware of that as you're choosing materials. Um, also being aware too that, you know, I don't see, you know, I don't see anyone sitting on these. I don't see anyone at all, but you know, how the material quality and reaction to um, the surroundings work together. And I just wanted to show this. Um, I also teach a class in construction details. So we talk a lot, a lot about um, constructability and materials and details. So this as a very simple kind of, you know, looks like a folded steel plate. It's really these two plates together with um, angles um, that hold the two pieces of um, steel together and then attached to this anchoring device that's actually anchored into the ground. Um, so it looks, you know, it looks pretty simple and delicate, but there's a lot of stuff happening underground to hold it in place um, for a pretty simple move. Um, another, you know, example of using wood and metal to create these um, larger pavilions that you might occupy. Um, and sit under, so these custom pavilions, you can kind of see them. Unfortunately, this photo was taken before the vegetation grew in completely, so the mulch and the wood kind of blend together. But you can see them emerging, um, you know, out of here, here, and one guy over here. Um, set within planting areas, so you can sit and kind of be immersed by planting, as well as, um, you know, conversing and talking with other people. These things have power integrated into them and lighting, so you could... Um, sit out and work. Um, you can also start to see too the different um, more program zones that are populated by furnishings and how planting areas and some of the geometries used to define areas of seating. So you know uh, areas of seating here, areas of seating within here, and then using bright colors that pop um, to differentiate the differentiate the furnishings from this pretty monotonous um, concrete paving. Uh, this other example for a small parklet in San Francisco. This is actually a real photo. It looks like a rendering, but it's a real photo of uh, metal, <laughs> you know, integrating some metal um, panel, like both paneling and a custom fabricated um, bench table morphing object. Um, to create a bunch of different conditions for you to sit, for you to work, for you to talk. Um, so, you know, the seating, the piece that you're actually sitting on here is wood and, and sitting against, um, so it's more of a warmer quality. There is these ideas of, you know, smaller tables within here that you could put a cup of coffee on um, or maybe a book. Um, there's a couple of different places to sit. You could sit down here. You could sit up here at more of a bar stool and watch the traffic go by. Um, it's also ADA compliant, so leaving a space for wheelchairs to come up um, and making sure it's accessible for everyone. And then behind this perforated panel, there's actually lighting too. So it creates this really cool kind of speckly pattern uh, at night. So you can imagine this pretty small parklet, you know, I think it just goes for a couple feet on either end, um, being occupied by multiple people doing multiple types of um, you know, seating, gathering, and then being able to use it at night because of the kind of illumination. Um, this project um, is actually local, so you could go out and look at it. It's Rondo Commemorative Plaza in St. Paul. Um, 
and the plaza is pretty simply defined. There's a concrete retaining wall along the edge and these kind of furnishing objects that sit on top of them. Um, and there are different heights and different orientations, so you could sit and talk to talk to people in a couple of different ways. Um, you know, you could actually sit on top of here, you could sit down here, you could sit on the wall, you could um, kind of sit and as a way to talk to people or um, uh, you know facing opposite directions. Um, but the wood creates a kind of a warmer a warmer platform for you to sit on um, and interact with people. So here's a couple of um, construction drawings that I actually helped develop. We, use, we used Revit for these drawings and made construction details from them, but you could start to see how these things um, alternate and articulate as well as some of the angles. So thinking about how, you know, an angle for a backrest and what a more comfortable seating position is, how you might start to think about, um, you know, standardizing and regularizing. Most of these things get regular, but different dimensions um, because there's a bunch of a bunch of them that are custom built on site. So how to make some of those those things more standard and easier for people to build? Um, and it's a pretty simple construction with just these wood slats attached to um, metal metal panels for the structure. Uh, so kind of a simple a similar idea for a metal structure holding up a wooden bench frame. Um, these, you could imagine that all of these uh, metal pieces are custom fabricated off site and then kind of assembled on site. Um, but the simple, the simple idea of just bending a steel frame creates this more um, playful and more organic bench form out of the same materials um, and kind of construction technique as this other project, right? So by using the frame as a way of articulating um, form, you can get a couple of different um, variations. So similar, you know, set of construction drawings just to show how you would think about these wood pieces being attached to a metal frame. That's actually the structure that's attached to the ground in, you know, some way that they don't show, but um, yeah, so I think a lot in a lot of furnishings too, we think about, you know, I mentioned like, we don't know how the things attach. You really, um, most larger furnishings, whether they're, um, you know, custom or off the shelf things, you do think about how things attach to the ground. A lot of the times you do need a foundation. So something's a little bit bigger. You actually have to have concrete below ground that this thing is bolted into. Sometimes, um, you know, it can just surface attach and you don't really need to think of a foundation or something heavier for it to sit on. Um, and then there's also more free form um, and loose furnishings that can be moved, can be moved around. Um, and sometimes, you know, things, you attach things to the ground because, so you don't want them to walk away. Other times as part of that, the structural mm -hmm. needs of the furnishing, you actually do need to think of attaching it to the ground um, in a more substantial way. Um, here's an example of a metal and wood bench, but I thought this was pretty fun because of the movable back panels. So you could think of how things are moving to create, um, you know, people, different ways for people to sit, right? Just by the simple moving of this panel, you could have three people sitting the same way, you can three people sitting in opposite directions or kind of half and half. Um, so just by kind of that simple move by putting a movable panel in the middle of the bench, um, three people can occupy this in a number of different ways. I also came across this photo. I just think it's fun. So how, you know, furnishings can be whimsical and fun um, and how materials can indicate how you are meant to occupy this by, you know, sitting. Um, you could kind of lay, but not necessarily. You know, if you were to think about more of lounging, you might pull the wood up a little bit higher too. So how material change and how you occupy could start to relate to each other. Um, you know, I'd want to lay in this, but I don't know if I'd want that shift between the two materials on my back. Um, but yeah, so whimsical and fun. Um, you could also think of too how uh, furnishings and planting relate to each other and how you can build something pretty simply that um, morphs and changes and creates different moments and different places for people to sit um, and also fits into a larger geometry with other paving, with trees, um, and other kind of planting areas too. 
Um, and there's, you know, integrated backrests here for people that want to sit with their back against something. There's things that are flatter, so you could have people sitting in two different directions or maybe laying down. Um, so very simply, just creating a number of different conditions through a simple move. Um, yeah, or, you know, kind of simply with wood and concrete, these, um, you know, custom but very simple types of furnishings where you can imagine people sitting in a couple of different ways. You know, two people could sit here across from each other, um, or you could kind of lay down and, and lounge on this larger piece. But also the idea that they're kind of within a movement corridor and people can move freely on either side with a slower zone in the middle, um, both by gathering furnishings, or this is indicated both by the gathering the furnishings and then um, some change in pavement. Um, or you could also think about furnishings that are peeling up from a surface. So it's not that you're sitting on something totally foreign to a larger design language, but the actual material of the floor itself is peeling up and creating places to sit. Um, you know, whether it's more benches or this is a project um, in Toronto called the Wave Deck, which is pretty cool. And it's just the surface that's articulated, which allow people to sit or play or run on. Um, in a couple of different ways. So it's the surface itself that's creating the different furnishings. Um, I mentioned at the beginning the um, idea of using you know, plastic or maybe rubber surfacing. So this project creates a continuous surface for um, you know, paving, but then it starts to looks, it looks like these objects are starting to just pop out of the surface. So there's different furnishings, there's um, you know, edges around trees and plantings that allow you to occupy this continuous surface in a couple of different ways. Um, and you know, not really knowing if you're on a bench or on the floor and being a little bit more playful with materials. Uh, the benches are made um, in this instance with either you know, a concrete base and this um, EPDM rubber surfacing is like hot applied to it um, to it that would make the form, um, or this is also with, you know, like a polystyrene or, um, high density foam shell too, that would make, or form that would make the custom objects that's just coated with the rubber surfacing. So it doesn't actually have any structural, um, qualities to it, but you can't tell, um, because kind of a, just a simple, you know, kind of construction technique. There's some fun, funny, I don't know if you can see some like funny tables too popping out of it that are coated with EPDM. So it's kind of a whimsical, a whimsical surface furnishing um, combination. Oh, they poured it. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure how they would get this this radius here. I um, am not as familiar with like how you could get it to. You know, I would imagine you would need actually something to, for this to pour on. But yeah, it's a um, like a liquid applied surface that you would smooth. And it's pretty thin. It's like half an inch or something. Yeah. Um, I just have a question about rainfall. Does somebody mm -hmm. have to walk through those trees? And can rain like get through the surface of that? Yeah, there are um, some EPDM, EPDM surfacing that is porous. Um, so water would be able to get through that. I would imagine, though, they would have to um, potentially irrigate the trees. I'm not sure how happy they're going to be, honestly, in the long term, <laughs> just because there's not much surface area for water to get in, um, even if this was all more porous. So, yeah, you can have this. The rubber itself is porous, and then the base underneath it would be um, a porous base, so something that's bigger aggregate or bigger rocks versus something that um, is not porous, which would either be smaller rocks or concrete. So yeah, if the base is something that allows water to drain through, then yes. Good question. Anyone else? All right. Um, so the next kind of technique that you could think about is prefabrication or offsite fabrication. It will allow you to um, you know, make 50 of an object or um, kind of mass produce um, objects multiple times. Uh, yeah, um, so these benches um, for the Times Square reconstruction by Snowheda are a series of um, big granite blocks that they fabricated off-site. 
um, to make it look like these benches are kind of emerging from the surface itself. So these construction drawings um, start to talk about, you know, radius, um, size of the pieces, length of the pieces. So you would give this to a fabrication shop and they would actually fabricate it off-site, then it would be trucked there and installed. Um, there's some other things going on here with expansion joints and how these pieces are actually held together um, with a type of joint that allows things to move and um, expand and contract um, and not crack. Uh, so you can see some of those benches here um, uh, that are lining the that are lining the um, larger plaza. So. Um, you could also think about precast concrete, so um, building something, a simple form that can be formed and precast off-site and you can have multiple of them. There is a limit to forms, you could use them like, I think we were told like 12 times and you have to make a new form too, so there's kind of an economy, economy of scales or if you know that you're going to need you know, between 40 and 50 of something, and if you know you can get 12 uses out of a mold, you might say, well, I'm going to do 48 pieces because then I don't need an extra mold. Because once you start adding molds, they start increasing in cost. We found out pretty quickly. Uh, but, you know, you can um, have some pretty complex forms that are fabricated off-site and then trucked in um, and placed on site. Um, this project is actually under construction now, which is um, pretty fun. It's in the North Loop. Um, you can kind of just see the buildings, but it's on an old site that was a brass, um, a b brass foundry. So, you know, repetition of a bunch of small, really precise objects. And we decided to use the precast process as a way of, um, relating to the history of the site. So you could also think of both materials and processes and how, um, those two things can, um, relate to the history of a site. Um, back to the High Line, um, you know, the most notable thing about the project are these kind of concrete benches that look like they're rising out of the paving, um, paving system. Um, that's done because the, the giant planks are, you know, precast concrete and then the benches are also precast concrete. So it could be done by the same manufacturer. So you have the, um, the mix quality and the color and the aggregate quality all the same and it really looks like this kind of seamless project. Um, there's also kind of wood integrated which you can't kind of see in this photo. Um, wood integrated indicating where you um, you would sit on um, where you would sit on versus something that's more relating to the family of the paving. Um, you can start to see here the different structural systems that are holding these things in place um, and connecting to a uh, concrete foundation that all these things are um, attached to, both the paving system and then the bench itself. Uh, you can also consider uh, steel as a fabricated object. This is the Pentagon Memorial, so there is um, a, essentially a bench for every victim from 9-11 that's within this memorial site. Um, it's very elegant, kind of twisting steel structure um, with a, a pond, I don't know, I don't know, with a little like water water area that has light underneath it um, and stone so it's a little bit more reflective and contemplative, um, contemplative. So you can see, you know, these things, there's a mold made and these things are um, poured um, and formed so there's uh, they're all the same and they're all replicated. And then they had these very beautiful series of drawings, um, you know, at the early stages of, you know, I think this was built in like, I don't know, 2002. So, you know, the early stages of fabrication and digital modeling. And you start to see these things um, on the site together. Um, you could also see too the bench rather than just sitting um, sitting in this crushed stone, they start to extend the trajectory, trajectory of these benches and kind of tie them together. Um, the direction is tied to the direction the planes were flying, so there's all these other sim symbolism and meaning um, in how they're laid out. And then also the form and um, looking at forms from um, aerospace and from plane forms and having that inform um, the bench design as well. And 
the piece that you sit on, it's I believe it's um, a stone piece too, so you're not actually sitting on metal. There's a, a place for something a little bit warmer um, to actually sit on. Um, oh, should have switched the order. So another precast concrete um, project, this is for Governor's Island um, in New York that opened a couple of years ago, but there's all these, there's tons of uh, precast concrete pieces that um, are benches, they're part of the paving, they start to emerge and fold back down. You can see here the mold itself, um, so building custom um, forms that have this kind of pattern um, engraved in it. So things that you wouldn't be able, even though these are concrete, you wouldn't be able to cast these on site. So really using the casting process as a way to make something really unique. Um, and see here just the number, <laughs> the sheer number of pieces they had and the sheer variation. Um, since they're precast, there's you know some economy to having you know you know 20 of these pieces or you know 15 of these pieces. Um, but even just by having you know, a range of pieces, they were able to achieve really interesting geometries and all of these different curves going around landforms and forming paths. Um, so you could also start to see the scale, <laughs> the scale of some of these pieces and the scale of this giant landform, which is super cool. And then how um, you could think of a paving, you know, a piece of paving folding up into a bench and then folding back down um, and starting to really create space in that way. Um, I think that's all I had for you all. If there's any questions, I can flip back to another slide if you want to learn some more about it. Um, but, you know, hopefully I was giving you a, a larger overview of how we think of furnishings, or how landscape architects can start thinking of furnishings in both urban environments, um, you know, parks and other, other landscapes, um, and how they're really tied, how they could be tied to paving, um, and how you think about the ground plane how they can be tied to larger infrastructural systems, and um, even how they could reflect character and history of a site. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I know there's obviously a wide variety of wood and different types of metal. Are mm -hmm. there pretty specific types of metals and woods that you guys stick to? Like you stick to hardwoods and steel and aluminum, things like that. Yeah. So why? Yeah, so hardwoods um, definitely hold up longer in outdoor environments. So, um, you know, there's like the tropical hardwoods, which we try, you know, definitely try not to use. Like black locust is a domestic hardwood that's pretty, um, it's kind of a weed tree and the wood's really hard too. So we do use that a lot, but there's like things like ipe um, and other types of tropical hardwoods that are durable um, for over a long term. And then they also are kind of mildew and rot resistant. So those are some things to consider with with wood. You don't want to use a a soft, you know, some a wood that's softer. And there's not too many woods that are used in outdoor environments. Which is, and then there's also it's kind of where the rise of um, you know treks or like the plastic wood. I don't know if you've seen deck panels that you're like that's wood, and then you like tap it, you're like nope, that's not wood. So like kind of the rise of those like plastic or composite products. For that reason. Um, and then metal, um, yeah, more like aluminum or steel or those kind of products. Um, you know, we use a lot of Corten steel just because it ages. Uh, it ages and then you can apply a kind of coating so it doesn't continue aging and break down, but you kind of stop it in that weathered but like precise look. Probably like things like copper, gold, or silver it might be nicer in some ways, but then. Well, yeah, and gold's, gold's pretty soft. Um, so copper, there's some like panels. I've seen really beautiful copper panels. They patina, they get green in like really interesting, uh, in really interesting ways. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, in the back. I noticed that some of the like, you had different like, grading changes, mm -hmm. like, especially if it was like, different than the landscape was before, it looked like a fit. So why, when and why would a designer work with like a different grade for a project and does that cause problems at all? Like especially like governor's island one mm -hmm. is, is what it brought up on. Sure. I mean grading is um, you know one of the main tools that landscape architects use to help create space. So these giant landforms where you could get up and have great views and then um, also how they're 
arranged on the island frame, you know, I think one view frames um, Statue of Liberty and another view kind of frames between the two landforms frames downtown. So um, in addition to that, they are, um, you know, you could, they could be more program based. So they're like smaller, more topography that you can imagine running around or playing on. Um, we do use grading as well to direct water flow, which I talked about. So, you know, pitches of surfaces um, that are draining into something lower for stormwater. So, yeah, I mean, whenever a landscape architect is on a project, like there needs to be grading typically done unless it's, well, I mean, unless it's like putting a bench out, which is like, we would usually do more than that. So, I mean, any, any sort of like manipulation of the ground plane, we do think about grading and how things are pitched. Um, whether they're pitched in one direction or kind of pitched to a spot in the middle or more warped. Um, yeah, it's a big, big consideration. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like moving water and like creating spaces. Yeah. Uh, how, much, how much do you take into account like if you modify students, would you like make a, like a chair, like a seating area? Could you like study pretty much like what's like the average like dimensions of a person, or you just like, have like a set number? Yeah, there's some dimensions that we use pretty often. So like benches, like at 14 inches above the ground, um, and like you know 18 18 inches deep. So there's some kind of more urban standards that we use I don't know if they haven't been like rigorously tested but having some of those dimensions in mind um, and if there is more like a custom a custom piece you know actually sitting we do actually kind of sit and like lean against things and kind of test things out or pace things out so the human how people interact with objects um, and spaces we test a lot and on some projects we do like actually build mock-ups where you like build something and then like test it so kind of similar i'm sure to your working process right you build things you test it and you can play with it so yeah. sir do you have a question or were you just stretching, no, just stretching. okay <laughs> yeah in the back um i know that people who don't know each other tend to not sit very close to one another mm -hmm. um in one of the slides, there was that you could pull up like a, a seat back for yourself. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how you guys know, like, how far to space step away for people to feel like they can still sit near somebody, but still mm -hmm. be like maximizing the space and not wasting it, like all that extra space. Sure. Um, you're talking about the wood. Where are we? This yeah, one. one. Yeah. Like, I feel like even if I was on. The opposite side, like sitting the opposite way to somebody, I would still feel a little like too close. Too close. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's definitely a, a consideration. So it's like having multiple oppor like multiple opportunities. If you are comfortable with kind of sitting next to each other or every other, um, I don't think there's like a hard and fast rule. But the fact that there's you know multiple benches next to each other, you could sit on the end. You could sit facing one way or facing the other way. Just having a bunch of different ways that you can occupy a space is um, probably the thing that we consider more than like actual proximity to someone else. Like, does this thing need to be three inches away or like eight inches away? It's more of just giving.